Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very last session of the day um, about M&A, mastering M&A, and the secrets to successful mergers and acquisitions. Um, I'm super excited um, to be here with you today. Um, short introduction of myself. I'm Thomas, uh, the founder of EU Startups, uh, a leading online publication about startups in Europe. Um, my team and I were also organizing an event called EU Startup Summit, which will happen in April of next year, again in Barcelona. And um, mergers and acquisitions uh, can be super enticing um, for many growing businesses. Um, few growth strategies provide as much impact uh, or change a company's trajectory uh, as quickly as a successful M&A deal. Um, and I'm super excited to have uh, two absolute experts uh, in that field um, with me today. Um, so we have Danielle Keevan with us, um, the VP of Finance at Paddle and Alka Tandan, the CFO of Gainsight. Um, so I would say we jump right into the conversation and um, maybe we start um, by um, letting you, Danielle, and Alka giving a brief introduction of yourself and the companies you work for. Um, Danielle, do you maybe want to start? Yeah, sure. Thank you for having us, Thomas. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm Danielle Keevan. I'm the VP of Finance at Paddle. I've been at Paddle now for about a year. Um, and we've gone through an acquisition. Companies previous to Paddle always also done a couple of acquisitions and integrations. So I'm very excited to share here um, all of our lessons learned on what to do and not to do. Awesome. Alka, you want to go next? Yes. Yeah, so I've been at Gainsight for about three years now, um, where we have, um, I would say, done two acquisitions. First, uh, we um, we actually sold ourselves to a private equity firm, which, you know, I'm excited to talk to you guys about. And we actually recently did um, an acquisition based in Amsterdam. Um, and before that, I have I've probably done about 15 acquisitions just in my career operationally. Um, and very early in my career, I was also an investment banker focusing on M&A. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, you guys already um, gave a hint there. Um, so you've both recently been involved in some uh, M&A deals. Um, could you maybe um, give us a brief overview of this most recent deal you both were involved in um, and um, share some uh, insights um, as far as you can talk about them? Um, who wants to start? Maybe Danielle? Yeah. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, I think at Paddle, we just closed off a very exciting uh, start of the year, I would say. We had our Series D funding round. And in the same time, we had the acquisition deal um, teed up, ready to go. So both of them almost occurred simultaneously. Um, and I think what has it's super fun to share the stage today with Alka because we've actually done the reverse. Um, so if, as a UK company, um, we've actually acquisitioned a US based company. And I think that makes for a very fun and interesting um, conversation as we move forward. Um, we've recently acquisitioned ProfitWell that is US based and they also have an engineering hub in Argentina. And it's been quite a learning experience. Um, I think one of the bigger things is the cultural dynamics that come into play, not just company culture, but just real people culture. And I think that's so important to make sure that that is, uh, you have a safe space to communicate around that to ensure your maximized returns. Um, when you do an acquisition or an M&A, whatever the reason, whether it be for the tech, whether it be for the talent, or even sometimes for the customer base, I think having an open space to really work together on that cultural integration and the collaboration that exists is super important to make sure that you maximize your return. Um, because definitely having that well in place can really optimize just integration, the speed of execution. Um, not addressing the cultural issues definitely can kill synergies that you're hoping to achieve when you acquisition a company. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Alka, can you talk about your most recent uh, deal? Yeah, no, and I agree with everything Danielle said. And yeah, it is fun because our most recent acquisition um, was actually a Dutch company. So as she said, we sort of did the opposite. Uh, so we also um, closed about, I think it was December um, of last year. It was a company called Incited. It was our community platform. And it was a way for us to expand our product line. So we were looking at ways. We are a multi-product company. Um, and it was a very natural extension. And, you know, we had been we had known of the company for, for some time. It also gave us um, a stronger European presence, which we already had one. But it certainly expanded it because we were ready to really um, expand that footprint um, also. And so um, it's, it's been a very successful acquisition, you know, and so I would say um, absolutely, in addition to the cultural 
um, aspect of it, really having a good integration plan um, as you move forward. And I'm sure we'll get into um, those details um, as well, um, as well as allowing the time for the integration. You know, I've definitely seen times where um, people will be very, very aggressive in that first year. And you actually, you know, want some time for the cultural aspects, but also for things like, you know, systems, um, as well as sort of combining teams and figuring out what's the right model. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, you both already touched here on cultures and um, hiring uh, from uh, acquiring from Europe an American company and from America a European company. Um, shall we maybe shortly touch on the differences uh, in um, uh, American companies versus um, European companies and what kind of challenges and pitfalls uh, did you experience uh, in, in this kind of setup? Sure, Alka, you want to go first? <laughs> yeah, sure. Hi, yeah, happy to. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I think one thing is, is, is cultural. I mean, I think this is probably the best time to talk about some of the cultural differences. And I think with that, it just takes um, a lot of just uh, like empathy. I think on, on both sides, you know, really understanding where each each team is sort of coming from, because there's also an impact in the team, um, at your your home team, you know, I call it, you know, your home team, you know, but your current team also. And so, and it's amazing how things like just even like, you know, time differences and things like that actually really do matter um, mm -hmm. and be understanding sort of like on, bo on both sides. Um, but I will also say, because I've done, you know, since I've been doing M&A for some time, it's gotten a lot easier as we've just become a global company. So, you know, um, I, I remember doing one very early in, in, my, in my career, and I would say that the differences were much larger. But now with the Internet, with social media and all these things, I do think that it has gotten, you know, a ton easier. And then honestly, there's a lot of just um, a lot more, I would say, just operational things like taxes and like audits um, and looking at legal structures. And I would say that, uh, you know, in hindsight, I think we would have liked to spend a little bit more time on sort of upfront and really understanding because that's taken a little bit more time sort of in the, in the integration. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think, I think for us, um, I've enjoyed the cultural differences, just a pure country culture. I think Paddle is a UK based company and having that US tech energy come in the room, I think that brings two pieces together. I myself am based in the Netherlands. So it's, that was, it's fun to me to hear Alka um, refer to like yeah. that company and, and the, the, the synergies and the dynamics there. I think for us, it's been the rule of thumb to always assume good intent. Um, it is fair to know that you will kick each other, you will hurt each other, you will get upset at each other. And this is before the deal is actually signed. So that's not even talking post-negotiation. And I think one of the more critical things is definitely to get in and build those relationships early with your founders, your CEOs, your leadership teams, to make sure there's a relationship there to catch the friction when it comes. Yeah. Um, and I think Once you've signed, um, indeed, that's when you start to work together. And I think often in M&A deals, there is a big focus on making sure there's talent retention for the first two years. You're not just buying, typically, you're not just buying a shell. You're actually buying an extension. You're trying to add onto your product. You're trying, trying to expand your team and your company. Um, so I think building those relationships to make sure that you have talent retention is super critical. Communicating mm -hmm. the excitement of the acquisition to your company is key. If you as a founder or leader are excited about the potential, that excitement is going to translate when you announce to your teams that they've been acquired. I think one of the more challenging things is if there's no communication around this, the first go-to is going to be fear. The second thing that's going to happen is your LinkedIn profiles of all of your staff members are going to blow up. Because all of the recruiters are going to be like, hey, that company just got acquisitioned. You should jump ship and come join us. Um, so I think communication with your team to make sure you retain your talent is super critical. Um, and also to make sure that as you go into this coming together of two companies, that you're not fighting in different qu corners, like my culture versus your culture, but to be open to exploring, to getting the two cultures together as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, what Alka mentioned is super interesting because um, audit firms have determined that 98% of the times in due diligence, the financial statements and state of the companies are deficient. Um, so, and I think when you hit, especially Paddle, we're experts in, in tax and, and finance is our product. So onboarding a company into our current structure is challenging and making sure that 
compliance is there and that you're giving it a time to do the integration is definitely key to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we talked about uh, culture uh, already. Communication is important. Um, taxes can be an issue. What other common challenges and pitfalls do you see uh, regarding M&A deals? I think the big the big one is is the is just the post integration and just having a plan sort of upfront. Even though the plan will likely change, but just starting to have a plan um, in place of like how you want the companies to sort of operationally operate, having that upfront and being flexible with it is super important. I mean, I think there's a, a, a stat of something you know like not you know it's it's easy to buy a company, but actually like integrating it and and actually extracting value from it is typically what's difficult. And it's a very high number. I think, you know, it's about like 90% of, you know, M&A transactions actually fail and it's because of the post integration piece. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and like we've been saying, like getting everybody on the same page, um, having very clear ownership of, um, of each team and having very clear goals, both financial goals and business metric goals that, you know, you're continuing to track, particularly for that first year, I think is, 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 is all those things are super important. Um, mm -hmm. And then I love what Danielle said about just, you know, like retention, I think um, uh, just, you know, keeping those employees and, and making sure um, that they, you know, that they're, we even like did a buddy system, you know, for, for people as they were kind of entering the company. And that was like a fun way for people to kind of get to know each other. We had a party, we had an all hands and, you know, we had like a fun little skit and we basically had a little bit party for the, for, for the company because they're coming in for inside to coming in. Um, so I think these little things actually matter. We had care packages sent, you know, these little things actually matter of keeping people. And also, you know, um, I think there definitely needs to be at least a discussion about um, retention packages. Very important. I mean, one of the pitfalls I've had in prior companies is really understanding the cap table of the company coming in and understanding how, frankly, people were compensated if they made money or if they didn't uh, make money. I've had one incident where um, we bought a company and nobody really made any money and, and they had been at comp the company for a very long time. So understanding those dynamics and then if you might need sort of even like retention packages for people, at least for the short term. Um, so, you know, really understanding things inside and out. And like I said, just understanding where people are coming from is super helpful. Mm -hmm. I, I think to your point, when you uh, acquire a company, especially for the te technology, um, when you have a strategy or you have a vision, it all seems so simple until you start bringing together the two pieces of technology. I think that's um, usually a challenge that has to be taken on quite carefully to make sure that indeed not just the end product or desired state that we want to work in together is achievable, but also how do you kind of start piecemealing the project and make sure you go step by step in sequential order. Um, to be fair, I think us on the financial side, usually uh, we get a pinata that you never really know what's in there. Um, as I said, like 98% of the due diligence um, that is conducted for M&As have deficiencies. And even so going into it, you feel like you know everything and yet you don't. <laughs> and so as you start peeling back these layers, that's when you start um, encountering the challenges from a finance and legal point of view. I think the other thing that is important to is to know ahead of time going into the M&A deal, what kind of legal structure you want to have it done in. Do you want a full integration? Do you want to keep it as a separate company? Um, do you want to dissolve and absorb? All these things have an impact on how you will financially assume responsibility and how the liabilities will transfer over. So I think that's also a critical step one to any M&A deal that you step into to understand not just what you want to do product wise, but also legal and tax structure. What is best for you the company and best for the company that you're acquiring at that moment? Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then post acquisition, um, I think it's probably important to keep track um, of the metrics of the acquired company, right? Um, how do you usually um, tr track um, the success of a deal? And um, maybe what percentage of deals usually uh, is, is successful in the end um, in, in, in your understanding, in your um, career and the deals what you saw? Danielle, yeah, you want to go, go ahead on that one first? Yeah. So, um, as I said, like I've seen a couple of acquisitions in some instances, especially when you buy a piece of technology that makes sense to complement your company. Sometimes the integration on the tech it can be so difficult that instead of absorbing the tech, they will rebuild it in the same specs. 
Um, and so I wouldn't say then that the, that the integration has failed because you've bought the piece of technology, but it does mean that reaping the benefits indeed and measuring success will take longer. Um, so I think to Alka's point earlier, as she mentioned as well, you need to give things time, not just integration, but also your returning on investment. It's not going to be overnight. And I think from a, yeah, we're in finance, so it's unrealistic to expect an overnight benefit. Um, in some instances, though, I think the return on investment is higher when you have compatible customers. So when you acquisition a company that's not only your tech matches, but also the customer base will enhance your own. That's really a great way to optimize your synergies. Like if we look at ProfitWell and, and, and Paddle, the companies together just make sense. Um, we're an end-to-end -end platform. We offer all of these solutions for all the SaaS businesses to do all of their taxes, their invoicing, their payments, and everything on. Um, and then on top of it, ProfitWell is going to come in and really add an additional propeller to make sure that we're beefing up the data side of things. How do you maximize retention? How do you maximize your insights in your business? How are you trending to other competitors in your space? And so I think that bringing the two together not only makes sense technology-wise, but the customers also are compatible. And so that's a great way to maximize your return on investment. To start setting meaningful metrics, I think you need both parties around the table and both metrics of both companies and find the best way to join them. Um, so I think just like we spoke about culture, that's also kind of how the integration has to go. It's a give and take. What makes sense for Paddle to measure? Do this, those metrics make sense? And what metrics does ProfitWell have? And how do we bring the two together? Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, you know, usually as you're going through an M&A transaction, there's there's a deal model where you've sort of taken their model. You've typically kind of done a little bit of haircutting and you've also tried to see, OK, you can probably extract some value. So we usually start there as sort of like, OK, this these, this is the goal, at least sort of the, for the first year. So that's sort of the financial metrics. And then I would say you would have sort of like operational. You might have some operational metrics. So operational metrics might be something like. Um, you, you know, your ca the CAC for the for the specific product, um, and so sort of like sort of things like that that are you know you, that you're basically that are maybe not actually on a PL, but you still want to track. As Danielle said, just you know, like even you're looking at you know, for the entire company. It depends upon your goals. That's you know also sort of why you bought the company. If it's also just a tech only acquisition, you should you will probably have just goals in terms of um, need to get these features out. We need, you know, we, you know, we need to finish, you know, the building, um, you know, this piece of the product by this amount of time. And so I always say, always don't, don't forget sort of like the non-financial um, metrics as well um, as when you're, when you're looking at them. And then, um, and then of course, there's just sort of, I, I would say like the integration timeline and the different pieces of the integration and setting those goals. You know, early on where we also set up like a, like a team. Um, that actually is look, like meeting basically every week, especially for the first few months and just seeing how things are sort of going. And so we've got sort of like the working team and then I'll say what, what sort of like the steering committee of execs that probably meet a little bit less frequently, maybe like every other week. Um, and then once we're sort of actually like in a rhythm, um, less so. The board definitely wants, to, wants updates. So at board meetings, you know, they will ask for updates. Um, we have found, especially early on, just having like a dashboard is is really helpful um, just to give, you know, the CEO also sort of, you know, just a flash of how things are going. And then, you know, once you're integrated, then, of course, you know, everything will change and it'll just be part of the big company. But I, I would say really diligent tracking, particularly in those first few months, is, is really helpful to make sure everybody's on the same page. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, um, short note to the audience, uh, the, the final 15 minutes, we also um, get some questions from the audience. So if you have already some questions in your mind, feel free to ask them in the chat and uh, we will actively um, involve you later on. Um, so I think another um, big topic uh, is build versus buy, right? Um, so CEOs and CFOs uh, often has to have to face the question like, is it, um, does it more make more sense to invest in organic um, growth in, in the company's own technology um, or to make this acquisition and um, bring on an additional team, additional technology? Um, can you share your thoughts and insights um, on when you think um, uh, an acquisition might make more sense versus um, building internally um, who wants to start? Danielle, maybe? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think this question should always be asked, not just in M and A, just in general, in any in any decision you make as a business. I think whether it is to implement a billing solution, whether it is to acquire a company, um, I think you have to look at what is it that you are your business is doing. What are you good at? What do you want to keep doing? Where do you want to go in the future? And where does it make sense to invest? If you know where you want to invest, that question is going to lead you to, well, this is a product that I'm going to purchase or this is a product that I want to build. So I, I, I think that's a very um, mission. It's very tied to the mission of the company um, and how you want to get there. I think if we look at a market and you think, ha, I can do that better, then you should definitely build it. But if you look at the market and an M&A &A will make sense if there's an ROI and you're like, hey, they're doing this really, really well. I have a product or half a product and this would really make it whole. That also makes sense to purchase or acquire. Um, not, It doesn't always make sense to build it in-house, although especially in a tech space, we know we love to build things ourselves. We always believe we can make it better. Um, and, and that's where you have to evaluate, again, where do you want to invest in as a company? Where do you aim to go? And how does this complement your product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't agree more. You know, I think it just starts with your own strategy as a company of, of sort of like where you're going. And once you once you know that, um, I mean, I, I, of course, you know, we're in finance, so we're big fans of models, but you know, what, like what's the cost and how long will it take to actually build it in house versus, um, you know, what are the options, you know, hope, ideally, you know, if you're, if you are an active, um, acquire or what, or aspire to be, you sort of know all the players in the market and that's sort of part of it versus, you know, how much do you really think it would cost to just acquire, um, something in house and then taking into account the integration when you actually think you're going to extract value. And then usually things get pretty clear um, when you look at sort of like numbers in that way. That being said, um, that's one tool, but it's like also still very important to look at other aspects. So other aspects might be, um, you know, as Danielle said, there just might be a player that's just doing it really, really well. And, um, and then it just might make sense to acquire them. M&A sometimes is also just sort of used as a defensive action when you see a player doing really, really well. And it's like, you know, well, OK, actually, I think instead of letting them continue, you know, it just it's a better time to just sort of fold them in right now. Um, and so, it, you know, there are there are other reasons why, why you acquire. And, and the last reason is sometimes, especially I think what we're going to see um, in the next few months is just you're just going to get at, at ideally at, at companies at a really, really good price. So um, that's another factor. So it's good to always look at the numbers. And then there, there are also just a slew of other reasons why M&A just might make sense at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just mentioned, Alka, getting companies at a fair price. Uh, so let's talk shortly about the current economic uh, outlook. Uh, so there's inflation, there's an economic downturn. Uh, what kind of impact um, are you expecting, both of you, um, on, on the mergers and acquisition space? Like, are we going to see more deals, lower valuations, or um, what is on the horizon? All of, all of the above, the, the ones mm -hmm. that you've ju you just mentioned. Um, yes, you know, I mean, I think as everybody knows, there, you know, a lot of companies received a lot of money in the last few months, and it was, um, as we say, it was growth at all at, at all costs. So, you know, money was also given the interest rates. You know, money was fairly cheap, and so companies were able to get it, and they were, you know, instructed. I think we should all take some responsibility. It's just other companies instructed to really just grow what it, to at whatever it took. The markets have changed drastically. Um, so now valuations are much more based on, if you look at the public markets, are much more based on and um, on profitability. Profitability is now favored. Um, money is no longer cheap because interest rates have gone up. So it will be now harder for people to continue to raise money if they don't have a path to profitability, which will be, frankly, you know, many startups. So therefore... Um, I, you know, I think, of course, uh, most companies will want to kind of raise if they are able to raise money, just kind of raise at a flat round. I do expect we'll see a lot of down rounds. We've already seen a lot of layoffs. And mm -hmm. then there will just be some companies that can't just continue or they're raising at such a low valuation that maybe they think that they can actually get acquired at a slightly higher valuation and they just decide to have an exit. Um, and then I think we're also just going to see a lot of pressure. You know, it's not just about the company, but also by the investors. 
there will come a time when investors will just need to give a return back and they will be looking at their portfolio and saying, okay, well, which one sort of makes sense to sort of like exit now. Um, so I expect that M&A uh, will increase, you know, in the next few months. And we've already seen um, some of this already, particularly in the public markets uh, at, at lower valuations, at valuations, and just with a, um, a more, um, you know, a, basically a more critical eye towards, you know, um, particularly like sales and marketing costs and CAC costs. Um, as well, and you know, a little bit more focus on profitability where where it makes sense, depending upon the stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yet, I, fully, I fully agree. I think valuations have definitely um, gone down. Um, I'm not 100% sure that's entirely merited, but it's more the uncertainty of the landscape that we're performing in as a SaaS industry. Um, I I, um, I do foresee that it's not it is the road to profitability. In addition, also that um, companies will be acquired. I mean, to, to Aka's point, at lower valuations. So there is definitely opportunity there. Um, it's gotten more expensive, but it also provides an opportunity for companies that have just received funding um, and just ha are sitting on a pile of cash, let's call it that way, to really look for opportunities to invest that um, and get higher returns than you would previously um, in the market where you have opportunity to do acquisitions that make sense for your business growth. Um, I think a lot of SaaS businesses are now proactively looking more to manage um, their bottom line. So it's not just, hey, how are we increasing our customers and increasing our revenue, but also how are we reducing our operational expenses? How are we reducing our cost of goods sold? And how can we manage the business more responsibly? Um, whereas um, to echo again, Alka, it, it was growth at all costs. I think that's definitely the spirit of the entrepreneur and in the SaaS space that we operate in. Um, and I don't think that we are not looking to grow, but we're not looking to grow at all costs anymore. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, well, when talking about M&A deals, um, and when we look at the buyer side, um, there's usually uh, there are like publicly traded companies who can be potential acquirers, uh, scale ups as a, that are strategic buyers, maybe a bigger um, competitor. And they can also be uh, private equity players, right, who um, take over a company uh, with the goal to further grow it and then maybe further down the road to IPO it. Um, can you share your um, uh, insights um, about about those different um, buyer profiles and um, maybe the, the, the benefits and the, um, uh, the, the negative aspects for the acquired company for each of those profiles? Who wants to start? Danielle, do you want Alka, me to take maybe? that one? Go okay. ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Happy to, because we, 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 went through, we went through this, you know, um, not too long ago. So, I mean, just in general, um, you know, strategic buyers, just, just so everyone, you know, understands is, are basically companies that are buying you for a strategic reason. So, you know, when we talked about reasons for a deal, remember we talked, we said we're going to, you know, this all starts with a strategy. They usually, because they're doing it for their strategy, they usually tend to be, a little, first of all, a little bit more generous. So that's probably one of the most positive things about being a strategic buyer. Um, if a, a, a con for a strategic buyer is to typically the company is completely folded um, within. And so usually, you know, particularly Danielle and I are here, you know, from finance, but, you know, things like GNA, um, you know, you won't usually have two GNA teams. So you sort of sort of know, OK, well, you know, I will I will help with integration and then I'll probably sort of like move on. Um, but, you know, R&D teams will usually stay on and they're additive and they're still working on the products. So. Um, you know, you do that. That is one where, especially if it's a much larger company, um, you just kind of know that sort of going in. But they tend to be a little bit more generous. If you're going to go with a financial sponsor, which has become, um, they've become much more active um, in the last, you know, I would say 10 years. And there are funds like Vista and Toma Bravo that really focus on SaaS companies. Um, the, uh, the, I would say, I will start with the con. And the con is they tend to be a little bit less generous, you know, in terms because they're really looking at, their return and usually private equity is looking to exit within three to five years. So there's a very specific time frame. Um, the pro is is that they're really looking to um, you know you're you're a continuing entity. So you will you're going to continue on and especially if you're not ready to kind of say okay I'm sort of you know done with this game. There are lots of options for exit at the end. You can go you can go public. 
Um, you could actually be sold to another financial sponsor that's become very popular in the last you know, few years. Or at that point, you can say, all right, you know, we'll go source with a strategic buyer. I can say, you know, for us, um, so Gainsight, for those that don't know, um, we are um, the customer success company. Um, our CEO and founder, Nick Mehta, um, started the industry and we are feel like we're just sort of getting started. And so we were not ready um, to definitely like to you know, sell to a strategic. At the same time, we knew, you know, we could have gone public. Um, at the at, you know in December of 2020, we were certainly at the size, but we really were interested in doing being like a you know long term durable company, and um, we felt like we just wanted to be a little bit more sizable, and we had things like you know we wanted to work on some of our operational items, and some you know certain things, and so we found a great partnership you know with Vista you know over months and months of you know you know talking with them, and they have been um, they've had a huge huge success. You know, they've got about, you know, $80 billion under management, 85 companies. And um, we knew that they, we were, we knew that they would be like great partners for us in this next stage um, that we were entering. And um, that has actually proven to be correct. And I'll say, we think it was, especially with the markets now, we think it was probably one of the best, with the, the best decision we ever made. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I think it definitely depends on the, the like the strategy of why you're acquisitioning. Um, I think in some instances as well, um, especially private equity might be excited if you're not making a profit in the sense of they want your technology so they can monetize it. Um, so there are different reasons to drive M&As. Um, and, I, and I think the important thing is to kind of look at what everybody sees, like, oh, this makes common sense. This, this is a good match. Um, then you have the investor's perspective, like how can I monetize it? How can I get my return and how can I exit? And then there's like the visionary potential that you can really look at, hey, which angles are we missing and what synergies can we optimize to really make this, this, this M&A work? Um, so I, I think there's different um, motivations definitely behind why M&A. And, and I think each of them are so is unique. I think the integration piece and some of that piece is is different or kind of the, you can have a, a list to go through and make it uniform as much as possible. However, I think when you're sitting around a table to discuss an m a it can be for so many different reasons that the discussions will never be the same. They'll all go in different directions. The value will not just be financial. Sometimes it's, it's with a product offering. So there's just so many different angles to an m a So one thing I can say, it's quite exciting to go through. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So both of you are super experienced um, and have seen uh, several deals uh, throughout your career. And we all learn through our um, mistakes, right? So um, I guess my question to you would be, um, what was one of the biggest mistakes that you and your team uh, did in the past when it comes to M&A? And what did you learn from it? Um, you don't have to go too too detailed or name any names, um, but maybe to share some um, some aspects uh, of where where it didn't work out a hundred percent in the past. Alka, um, do you would want to start, yeah, or Daniel? Mm-hmm. I'm happy to kick this one off. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I I think the biggest mistake anyone can make is assuming that it's going to be an easy one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the moment you assume or, you, or you're overly confident that it's an easy integration mm-hmm. or an easy um, bringing together of two companies, I think that you're starting in a negative position. Um, I've had several situations where we've acquired a company, for example, from an accounting and finance perspective that has the exact same ERP and has the exact same um, tooling. So you're thinking, oh, this is going to be easy. It's one and one makes two. Um, And as you'll find out, one and one will take a very long road to become two. So I I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I've seen. Um, I think often as well, I see that finance is not immediately and in some companies this happens included in the conversations on how product is going to integrate and what happens is you'll have the finance and legal team going right and the product team going left and to bring that back together um, and an integration has been something that um, has massive impacts um, and also liabilities that can be incurred if your your tax structure and your legal structure and your entity structure do not follow or the product that you've integrated doesn't follow that structure. So that's, I think, one of the challenges that I've seen. Um, the other challenge, and it, and I think one of the questions was hidden to that, is make sure you have talent retention, um, especially when you have an M&A that you're, you, you're like, oh, this should be straightforward. 
you are going to need connection points to make sure you understand what's under the hood and how things came to be where they are. So I think not making, not prioritizing um, your customer base and your employees is definitely something it, it, it can be, it, it can cost you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I, I definitely agree. Um, I will add to that um, having over aggressive goals the first year, I, I, I think was one. I mean, we did have one incident where it was, a, you know, negotiate, negotiation with our board and it was pre revenue and, it, and we basically had, you know, very aggressive bookings goals. And so um, I would say I, I would actually do sort of the opposite, particularly that first year, because also with morale, you know, when you don't make them, it, 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 it sort of just doesn't just doesn't really feel good. So um, I think, you know, all around you want to just have really good, you know, goals that, you know, you think you can really hit the first year. And then um, just really understanding the, the go to market model of, of what you're acquiring. You know, is, is it is it the same customers? Is it the same buyer? Um, understanding that and understanding sort of like, you know, the cross sell, true cross sell potential as you kind of bring these companies together. So I think understanding the go, the go to market model is like pretty critical. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Okay, so I think we can go over and have a look at some questions from the audience. There were some very interesting ones I already saw. Um, let's start with this one. So uh, probably the biggest acquisition recently was the one um, uh, of Adobe acquiring Figma. Um, I assume you guys also have heard about that in the news. Um, both two leading players in the design um, space um, and, and design tool space. And um, our um, uh, our question uh, our, our, our question here is: um, What do you think about this deal? And um, um, was this maybe um, a strategic move of Figma to avoid an IPO in the current um, uncertain times, or do you think this is just a perfect um, um, perfect match? Um, what are your thoughts on that deal? Did you follow it any anyhow? I, I can. I can share a little bit. Oh, go, go ahead, Danielle. Uh, um, no, go, go ahead. You started. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah. That it was. First of all, it was, it was a very large one. So you know, um, you know, and I think so. The IPO market for most companies right now is essentially closed. Um, you know, we're seeing non-tech IPOs, and you know, as I've gone and, and talked to a lot of people, I think everybody's sort of expecting next summer. Fingers crossed that we might see some premier, you know, tech IPOs go out and then everyone's going to see how they go. And then um, we'll see if there's an actual appetite for, you know, um, other tech companies. So that, so in general, so they, so Figma certainly could have waited. I just, I think they just got a, frankly, a phenomenal price. It was 50 X revenue, mm -hmm. which is, you know, and just for everybody's, you know, knowledge, the average SaaS company right now is five X of revenue. So they, and they got 50 so I think it was just one of those, um, frankly, incredible opportunities in terms of, you know, really value um, for the business. And I would imagine knowing a little bit about Adobe, um, that they probably had a great integration path and story for the entire team. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think the economic downturn um, that we're talking about definitely puts companies in a position that IPO is should be an option. You don't want to have to be forced to do an IPO right now. The market's not ready for it. Um, and again, the pricing, the valuation they got for the value they got for the, the, during this acquisition was amazing. Um, but also to see how it will enhance the current products, um, I think that it, it makes sense, right? The offering that they can bring together is a way bigger scope, and it just makes sense as a next step. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good. The next question uh, is. Um... So someone asks, uh, I have seen an acquisition where the acquirer offered a less interesting salary package uh, to the acquired startup's employees. In that case, all employees decided to leave uh, right in the next month after the acquisition. Um, is there a, a way to retain talents um, um, in, in, in such case, or do you always have to offer a more uh, attractive uh, package um, in terms of salary or um, shares um, to the uh, acquiring company. Yeah, I, I, that? Mm -hmm. yeah I, I think we covered this a bit in, in the culture as well. Um, if your aim is to retain people, offering them less is probably not the strategy that you want to go. 
Um, and I think getting the founders and the CEOs excited about the acquisition to, for example, say, hey, guys, this is a startup. We built this product. We all know it's kind of hacky. Uh, we're kind of taping it together. We've been acquisitioned by this company who's way larger t- usually. Let's see what they can do with our product and make it better. And that would also make you a better startup person because you know where your product can grow into. So the next startup you go to, you'll have that experience of a bigger company. So I I think getting that excitement of the story in is important next to the compensation. um, If talent retention is your objective, then offering them less obviously is not the way to go. You definitely want to offer them equal to or more than, and if possible, an options scheme that will make sure that it vests over a certain amount of years. Because you don't want to retain them just for a couple of months when you're norming and storming as a team. You want to retain them for at least a year or two minimum. And so having like a good stock option scheme as well, um, whatever options you can put up together to make sure that it ensures that they're committed as well to the new path to success is definitely important. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Do you have anything to add there, Alka? Yeah, I, I agree with Danielle. And, and she said something very important, you know, if they want to retain the other people, because, you know, because when I when I read that question, I think, OK, they actually didn't want to retain and they were using that, frankly, as a tool yeah. um, mm-hmm. or, um, you know, assuming good intent, which is something that, you know, we, we started with this discussion you know, maybe those employees were just being paid a lot more than the current employees and they were trying to right size, but it's just probably not the right time right after you acquire somebody to, to do that. I completely agree. The options package is super important. And then I also, we, we talked a little bit earlier about just having um, additional like retention bonuses. I mean, that's definitely a tool um, that I've used, particularly like in the short term, you don't want, you don't want to do it, you know, in the long term, but for the first six months or 12 months, having actually like retention um, bonus. I, really explaining the story, as Danielle said, I think is really critical. Um, so mm-hmm. super, super important there. And um, and then, you know, there are other reasons why people stay, you know, culture, you know, benefits and just making sure everybody understands that um, as well as sort of the potential. Like, for example, I mentioned, you know, inside a team will um, really, um, in addition with the current team we have in London, really spearhead um, the next wave for us for you know Europe. And so th- their story might be a little bit different than if we acquired again um, in, in the US. So I think all of those elements, I also think it depends upon the market. So last year, it was very hard to retain people. Um, this year now, you know, where we are seeing a trend attrition levels um, sort of drop as well. So taking the market into account is super important. Mm-hmm. Okay. Another interesting question here. Um, so the startup environment is a bit unpredictable at times, right? And um, so it's harder to raise debt uh, in order to finance an acquisition. Um, from your experience, um, from the buy side, um, what's what's a good mix um, um, of capital resources um, to uh, finance uh, an acquisition? Um, and um, how hard is it for tech companies these days to uh, get um, external finance um, from from traditional banks maybe to finance um, uh, those takeovers? Yeah, I'm going to deflect to Alka because she's had a bunch of experience more than mine in the under the belt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have found that if you are a strong company, you know, you can still typically get debt. I think it's just a matter of like what what cost. So, you know, debt is typically um, for SaaS companies, um, at least traditionally, we'll see if it continue if it changes in, in the coming years, has been based on, you know, a multiple of ARR for the most part. You do have EBITDA covenants and you might have some other, other covenants, but usually you're able to, mo- for most people, you're able to get debt. One of the benefits of um, having a private equity sponsor is that they have a lot of relationships with debt holders. And so, not only do you are you introduced with um, to a lot of uh, people can, that can give you debt, but you actually, frankly, usually get have special pricing. So I would say, um, you know, you you know, we're against a little bit in a fortunate position. That being said, it's really based on you know how you are performing. Um, it, you know, the the mix question is uh, an interesting one, and it, I think it's it's not it's really actually depends upon your goals. So, and what your opportunities are. So for example, we, we do still have access to debt and um, especially since we're owned by a financial sponsor, as well as just for our own, um, you know, our own goals, we would really rather not dilute 
um, the employees. Uh, and so we would prefer debt. Um, uh, but you know, of course, if you don't have the, if you don't have access to debt, then of course, I think then, you know, you're probably going to go the equity route. So I think part the first thing is, you know, just sort of like, what are the opportunities that, you know, you have? Um, and then I think in general, most people would rather not dilute themselves if they can help it. Um, and then of course, you know, and then of course just issue equity to sort of employees, um, but if that's not available to you, then um, and you have a really good opportunity, then I would say, you know, go for it, because if you're able to extract the value, then it'll be worth it, even if you're issuing equity. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Danielle, any additional thoughts on that? Um, I, I think next to the financials, I think having a good vision, a strategy as well as to where you're going. Um, I think knowing and, and having a, also a successful track record, right? You might be down and out this round, but you know that your success has, you've had successes under the belt and you know where you're going as a company. Understanding how you will bring this all together also helps ensure that you get financing, even if the times are tough. Um, I, the money is not gone. It's there. It just costs yeah. more. So when people are giving you money to invest, they just want to make sure there's an ROI and that they're investing in a sure thing. Nothing is a sure thing, but I think that's our job in finance to make sure that we convert it to reality. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Danielle and Alka. Um, unfortunately, we're running out of time. I still have a bunch of questions here lining up, uh, so I think we could continue for another one hour, <laughs> but um, we're coming to an end. So um, thank you so much uh, for um, this conversation today. I learned a lot. Um, I hope the audience also learned something new. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, thank you for have having a great us. Day and a good evening wherever you are, and uh, talk to you soon. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Thomas. It thank was amazing. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.